Hello everyone, this is Professor Casey, welcome back. Uh, today we're discussing chapter 19 of David Emery Shy's America, a Narrative History, specifically talking about the Gilded Age. Okay, and we've discussed this term, the Gilded Age, already uh, in chapter 17 uh, as a period that refers to um, the time frame from the late 1880s, roughly, until probably the first decade or two of the 1900s. Okay, and this um, overlaps again, as most of Shai's work actually does, with previous time periods that we've discussed already. But this one specifically has more to do with um, common features uh, all over the country, right? This is less of a sectionalist uh, chapter and just more of a, a, a national uh, temperature, I guess you could say, about how society is working, um, and primarily in bigger cities. This is where a lot of these uh, class differences start to pop up and so forth. Um, the, the image you see here in the background, for instance, is a working class slum uh, from one of the bigger cities in the United States, perhaps New York, um, sometime around the turn of the century. And when, it just, when we start getting into talking about big cities, um, one big thing that people are starting to get really involved in now is politics. And political life at the end of the 19th century leading into the 20th century is determined by three major factors in the United States. Um, for one thing, the Republicans and the Democrats are pretty evenly divided in terms of their support. Um, one side doesn't necessarily win out by a vast majority over another, in other words. Um, and this is really kind of a holdover from the Civil War, in, in fact, because we still have the country pretty evenly divided in terms of its ideals, in terms of its geography, um, and that really starts to reflect pretty heavily in politics, um, so much so that even uh, the individual uh, political parties start to fracture in and of themselves. Okay, People are that, um, that closely divided and maybe have only one or two issues that they disagree on. And the public starts to participate much, much more in politics as well. Um, part of this has to do with the fact that we have uh, now major hubs in cities where people can go and vote on a regular basis. Um, the, uh, the Democratic Party is one of the main parties that has, uh, at least in the early 19th century, started to pitch the idea of campaigning for a presidency or for political office by actually going out and meeting the people themselves, trying to, you know, put a face to a name and a personality to a name and so forth. Um, and in cities in particular, there is a, a culture specifically surrounding areas like saloons uh, and, and pubs and so forth where people can come, socialize, have political debates, and uh, at some particular point vote on who they believe needs to be elected. And as we've already established, uh, from the end of the Civil War all the way up until this particular point in time, for roughly the past 30 or 40 years now, um, the Republican Party and, um, uh, and big business are very closely associated with one another. Um, one tends to complement the other, one tends to uh, support the other either monetarily or in terms of political support or both in some cases. And the other thing too now that we are starting to become a much more urban country right now that cities are starting to grow now that uh, it becomes much more difficult to maintain a living in an agricultural sector in the United States more and more people are starting to migrate towards cities. Um, farmers, for one thing, are having a really tough time now that uh, industrialized farming is starting to pop up all over the country. Um, these industrial farms are starting to sell products at market for a much lower price because they can manufacture them on a mass scale, just like factories can. And young farmers, or small farmers, I should say, not necessarily young ones, many of them are, are young who actually end up moving to the cities, but small farmers in general are, are really... Um, struggling because they need to raise prices in order to be able to pay off their own debts. Okay, so they're kind of stuck in a catch-22 here. And by the 1890s, um, farmers really start to campaign, especially in third-party politics, which starts to crop up again uh, from time to time, beginning in this point and moving forward. Um, farmers start to um, spread these third-party politics ideas that we need to uh, create more economic inflation. Um, greenbackism, of course, is something that's already had a presence in the United States very briefly for a time to try to relieve debts, right? The more inflation we can put into the country, right, the bigger the money supply, 
the greater the chance that people have of paying off their debts. And as I said before too, okay, urbanization is still a very common thing now, right? These farmers, especially the younger generation of farmers, again, who are having trouble maintaining the, the business or the lifestyle of their parents or who are simply bored with it, who don't want to have to do with it anymore, um, end up moving to the cities and trying to find work in factories as unskilled laborers. Um, and the South is really the biggest part of the country that is failing in terms of trying to maintain what it had before the war. Uh, again, the, the cotton industry alone maintained about 60% of all exports from the South. Okay, and now that that's gone, the 40% that's left over is dwindling pretty rapidly. And again, the North, as we said in Chapter 17 and Chapter 16, are, is, is flourishing, right? People are starting to incorporate areas of uh, technology and innovation into public life as well. So um, there's a, the, the floor of living is rising in those places. And in terms of the geography of urban life, too, this is um, something that we start to see already in the North and, again, in the West as well, as we've already established in the last two chapters. Okay. Um, most urban dwellers are actually out west, believe it or not, even though the west is um, mostly uninhabited in terms of the, the population density of settlements and so forth. But in cities in particular like San Francisco and Denver, um, those particular populations are larger in some cases than the, the combined populations of other areas in the northeast. And most of the biggest cities, right? Most of the areas where people are actually, um, where cities are largest, okay, is actually, of course, in the Midwest and in the Northeast, as we've already established. Um, the the thing about the large por uh, proportion of urban dwellers in the far west, I should specify this, is more people are actually living in cities out west than they are on individual homesteads. Okay. And primarily because homesteads are um, open to Native American attacks, they're open to the elements, um, they're very far separated from other um, major urban areas where you can actually get products, where you can get things that you'll need. Okay, So if you do go out west, chances are you're going to migrate to a specific urban area, a specific city, one place or another. And if you stay... Uh, but you won't end up staying on a homestead for very long. Or if you do stay on one, it's not too far from the cities. By 1900, too, it's estimated that over 90% of New York's population lives in rent houses or in tenement housing. Okay, and tenement housing is um, the kind of the the what we now consider to be uh, government project housing, right? Basically, inner city housing that has uh, been left to be debilitated, right? It's uh, it's poorly funded, poorly maintained. Um, and because there have been so many immigrants to the United States during this period, it's very difficult for people to gain enough money on a, a rapid scale to actually be able um, to, um, to, to have a better life than this. And of course, if you do live in an inner city anywhere, right, even still in, in the 21st century now, um, for one thing, inner cities tend to be very crowded. They're not as crowded today as they were back then. Um, but there is still a very large presence of crime, and in this particular time period that we're discussing here, the crime is directly related to the population density and to the fact that there is such a, a large immigrant contingency in this particular area. Um, uh, many times these immigration populations simply don't get along with one another at all. Uh, they come from cultures that are already at odds with one another for one reason or another. Um, and if they do come to the United States and they do set up shop in a city sometimes, um, quite frankly, there, there's so little opportunity that many of them have no other recourse but to resort to crime. Okay? So it's, it's, a, it's an element of desperation that, again, we still see even today in the 21st century. Right? Inner cities uh, have, have gone through various waves of what we call gentrification. This is the, uh, the effort typically by a local government to try to improve uh, a specific area by one means or another, but uh, by and large when it comes to crime it's usually associated with desperation or you know any other number of factors in today's time world. Um, and the middle class now is beginning to move into suburban areas for the first time, okay? And this is the beginning of that period leading into the example that I just gave, right? Where uh, 
if the middle class ends up moving out of cities because of the presence of immigrants or whatever the case may be, right? whatever reason is given, um, the inner cities are left to, uh, again, kind of fall into disrepair, really. And that's really what ends up happening, especially in a bigger wave once we get into the 20th century and what causes so much uh, institutionalized racism, racial disparity, uh, economic gaps, and, and all kinds of problems. Okay, so it's, it, it boils down to that specific factor of being um, uh, just, just a form of institutionalized racism. Again, I keep using that term over and over again, but it's, it's very, very relevant. By the 1870s, um, again, these different little uh, technological innovations that have been made uh, but thanks to individuals like Edison and Tesla and so forth, we start to see those being used, again, in the, uh, in the public sector, right? People start to use steam radiators, and so now larger buildings can be uh, heated by uh, steam rather than uh, coal-burning fireplaces, rather than chimneys, right? So there's uh, less of a chance of people developing... Um, asthma or any kind of um, upper respiratory issues if you live in a city. Um, the Otis Elevator Company begins to install the first electric elevator in 1889. Again, this is thanks to Tesla and to the alternating current motor that he develops. Okay, And now cities can start to develop upwards, quite literally. Okay, we, This is when we start to build skyscrapers for the first time. Okay, And a skyscraper is considered to be any, or any building in a city that's over six stories tall. Okay, And in most major cities today, that's very much the case. Right? We have buildings that are easily 20 stories tall, if not more in some cases. By 1873, San Francisco begins to use cable cars for public transportation. This cuts down on a lot of the, uh, the sanitary issues when it comes to people riding horses and uh, horse-drawn carriages all over the city. Uh, again, horses eat and horses poop, and the poop that is left behind is essentially left there. Okay, and there's this is before any kind of sanitation efforts have really been put forward in most of these cities okay so there is no um, there is no garbage uh, pickup on a regular basis okay there are no street cleaners um, there are no sewers in many cases so if you use a privy of some kind a toilet it doesn't necessarily empty into a sewer okay you have to do it in a bucket <laughs> and and throw it out the window quite literally so um, as disgusting as it sounds that is the normal for this particular point in time and it makes cities that much more uh, dangerous to live in, okay, because of the, the uh, potential for the spread of disease. Okay. In 1904, New York's subway system begins to open for the first time. And this little image at the top right that you see um, was, uh, was one of the first images of what the subway could have looked like, right? A lot classier than what we tend to associate with New York subways uh, today, but... I think this was more of an artist's rendering of what the, the imagined appearance was like. And again, you see the gentlemen who are walking into this particular area, um, the, the fellow sitting down especially, he's dressed like an upper-class guy. Okay, So it would be more expensive to ride the subway than it is today. And just to give you an idea, now that I've given you a bit of a description here, okay, the background images you see here <clears throat> are the first efforts at, um, at street sanitation. And they're very crude, as you can tell, right? Just basically fellows picking up garbage by hand, with a broom perhaps, um, and at the top right you see all the, the trash cans that are literally overflowing onto the ground with debris. And by 1900, it's estimated 2.3 million people are living in tenements in New York City, okay? And these tenement houses are, again, they're very much like what we consider to be government project housing, okay? Um, they're extremely uh, tall, for one thing, compared to buildings at the time period, six to eight stories. And the thing to keep in mind as well is there are no elevators installed in these buildings, primarily because elevators were considered to be... Um, something of a, an expensive commodity, right? If you tried to um, put something in a building like that, the, basically the government would say it's not worth it because these people are, um, you know, they're barely able to afford rent uh, and you, you can't necessarily charge them more to live in a, a building that has nice amenities like this because they won't be able to afford it. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it's estimated that there's between 24 and 32 families in each building, okay? And the families that we're discussing here, again, are primarily immigrant families, many of 
of which uh, are at least four or five people at minimum. Okay, sometimes these families would have upwards of a dozen people because these couples would have so many children, um, primarily because the the life expectancy was so small. So you would have uh, several hundred people living in each building, all crowded, all cramped in these tiny little apartment buildings. Um, and again, there's there's very little uh, in terms of sanitation, even in these buildings, right? The living conditions are very poor. Um, disease can spread rampantly. So if one person catches cholera or typhus or malaria or something, it can spread from one person to the next like wildfire. Okay? All throughout history, anytime we've seen diseases that have uh, spread in such a rampant manner, the Black Plague, for instance, uh, it usually has to do with population density in a city. It's like kindling catching fire. One person catches it, and then another, and another, and another, and it just spreads. And to use that metaphor in a literal sense, fires happen quite often too. This is before fire escapes occur, um, are, are made for the first time. This is also before any kind of um, uh, government inspections of buildings actually happen. Okay, So sometimes these buildings are lined with asbestos, which is very flammable. Sometimes they're... Um, they are heated very poorly, or the pipes that are put in to, to spread the heat uh, are enough to, you know, um, to get overheated. Anything can happen, right? Boilers are put in, uh, installed improperly, pressure gauges explode, all kinds of things happen. And again, back to the sanitation issue, so on average, there's only one toilet for every 20 people, okay? So if, uh, if you have a single floor with, you know, I don't know, several about five or ten different families living on a single floor, right, you might only have two toilets for, for each of those families, or two toilets combined for all those families. So that's a, um, again, not a very, um, not a very happy time to live in, to say the least. And as you could expect, if you have children during this time period, child mortality in some of these buildings can be as high as 40%, okay? And that's a staggering number, not just because of disease, although that probably is the largest contributing factor, but again, because of accidents. Uh, again, if you are, uh, there, there's not really any safety latches on windows, so children can fall out. Again, there's no fire escape, so if a building catches fire and burns down, just about everybody inside will go down with the building unless they can get out on the ground floor. Okay, so it's a very, very dangerous time to be a child. And again, late 19th century cities in general have this particular appearance that you see in the background. Again, just because a city might have most of the technology, it might have the most um, urban amenities, it's still overflowing with issues, okay, quite literally in some cases. Again, Garbage and raw sewage is dumped into the streets. Um, there, there is not really any sense of clean living that can happen here. Okay, um, sewers don't actually start becoming developed until we get probably um, into the first decade or so of the 20th century. In some cities, they they start developing within a few years before that. But again, it's it's we're it's hard to generalize. Okay, because each individual city with funding with corruption with all that kind of stuff it's it's a case by case basis and again all the different uh, types of major uh, communicable diseases end up spreading very rapidly and again if you're a child in particular you're more prone to catching these things or if you're one of the elderly okay and the, the average lifespan during this time period really wasn't that great anyway uh, most men were probably living to maybe the age of 45 maybe 50 if you were extremely healthy but sanitary reforms do start to finally accrue over time. Okay, we do have uh, sewer systems. We do have clean water reservoirs that start to be built. Uh, people start to get actual running water into their homes for the first time instead of using a well. Um, and the other thing too is now the the slaughterhouses and the, the the livestock presence in cities starts to be moved out of the cities by government re regulation. Uh, before then, if you lived in some place like Cleveland or Cincinnati or um, or Chicago even, uh, slaughterhouses could be right in the very center of the heart of the city. Okay, So if you're walking down the street, the entire city could stink like rotting meat. Okay, It's, it's extremely unhealthy, and if you have nothing but um, awful, right, the, the leftovers <laughs> of, of what happens when, when an animal is slaughtered, then um, that in and of itself can spread disease. Okay, And especially if... 
um, if you have, you know, uh, it, it draws disease, it draws flies, it draws all kinds of problems. Okay, so finally, uh, these places start moving these areas outside of the city limits. And even today, you have to go outside of a city limit to find a food processing plant of any kind. They're usually not built inside any cities. And in some places, like I said, like San Francisco, you start to see electric trolleys begin to replace horse-drawn carriages for sanitary reasons, if nothing else. Okay, just because it's it's easier, it's more efficient, it's quicker than to um, than to ride around on a horse and buggy. In the 1870s, it's estimated there's under three million immigrants on an annual basis. Right, this is still the time period when we're finally beginning to advertise immigration to the United States. Businesses are starting to ramp up. They want more people to come work for them. By 1900, though, we're at 9 million annually. Okay, so there's, this is an overwhelming um, amount of people who are showing up in the U.S. And um, it's, it gets to the point where people don't realize the desperation all over the rest of the world, especially in Europe uh, and in the Far East, has gotten so desperate that people are migrating um, uh, out of sheer desperation more than anything else. And again, big business is the one that is encouraging most of the foreign immigration, right? Because they, they want more workers, but eventually the number of workers or the number of immigrants ends up outpacing the need, okay? And so by the time we get to, um, okay, just to backtrack a little bit here, in 1864, the government passes what's called the Contract Labor Act, okay? And this is what starts to spur uh, immigration to the United States uh, en masse for the, for the first time. This is where the government is actually offering to pay uh, for immigrant, immigrants to come to the United States. It's not something that we uh, can really even imagine today because of the sheer number of immigrants who come to the United States. The government constantly has this little pushback thing that it does today, but um, back then the population density of the United States was so low it was easy to be able to do that. In 1868, though, we end up repealing the act because of the sheer number of people who suddenly start showing up. And by 1885, we have to enforce the stop of this because people are, are showing up so, uh, so many of them are showing up. And we have two different waves of immigration, which I think we've already discussed in class, but um, in, just in case we haven't, we'll review here real quick. Uh, the first wave of immigrants that happens before the year 1880 is what's referred to as old immigrants or the old immigration wave. Okay? And these are primarily Protestants and Catholics coming from Northern and Western Europe. Okay? They typically end up speaking uh, the same language or some variation of the same language that people in the United States are accustomed to hearing. In other words, English of some kind. Okay. At least for this time period, right? Language in the United States is not diversified as much during this point. And after 1890, right, once we get to uh, roughly a 10 or 20 year span after that, we start to receive waves and waves and waves of what we refer to as new immigrants. Okay, And these are immigrants from uh, South and Central and Eastern Europe primarily. So individuals coming from Russia, from Poland, Greece, Italy, the Baltic nations, um, all of whom end up speaking a completely different language. Even though they might look, right, they might have the same skin color as many Northerners do, right, if you're a Northern white individual, right, but if you come to the United States with a completely different language, um, there's, a, there's more of a pushback now, okay? People are actually starting to say, well, we're going to try to um, start dividing up society a little bit more now. We're going to start to try to striate this uh, quite often for the worst, as you can imagine. Okay, And you start seeing um, these new immigrants fall into more and more situations where they're being exploited, where there's a lot of um, use of them being put into sweatshops or in dangerous situations. Um, and, for instance, uh, Upton Sinclair's book, The Jungle, right, deals with Polish immigrants working in a slaughterhouse somewhere in the Midwest. I can't recall what city offhand, but, but these, are the, these are the types of jobs that new immigrants would be given, right? Basically, the jobs that no one else wants to take, right? The ones that are uh, demeaning, degrading, dehumanizing, uh, and quite often unsanitary or unsafe in some regard. And because they, again, because they are so different from these old immigrants, right, again, they start to be treated as second and third and fourth class citizens, okay? So their, their languages are different. In many cases, their religions are even different, okay? They're not necessarily 
um, Protestant or Catholic, right? They might be, uh, in some cases, they might be Eastern Orthodox if they're still sticking with Christianity. If they come from certain portions of the far uh, of the Middle East or the Far East or even um, uh, in kind of the Asia Minor area, right? They might be Turkish, for example. They might practice Islam. Okay, something that the country is not necessarily accustomed to at this point in time. And their motivations for immigration are very different from the old wave of immigrants. Okay, um, in some cases, new immigrants are only uh, expecting to immigrate to the United States for a brief period of time, uh, accrue some funds of some kind, and then return to their homeland, so that the exchange rate ends up being higher for their country. And when they exchange the money for for you know U.S. dollars, they can live as wealthy individuals for the remainder of their lives. Again, that's what they have in mind, but because of the situation they find themselves in when they land in the United States, again, they're so up for exploitation so often, um, or exploitation, I should say, that once they are put into that situation, they can't climb back out of it. Okay, and so they're put in kind of that endless cycle of debt. Um, and again, there's different little cultural communities that start to pop up in certain um, certain cities all over the place. So you might have a Chinatown somewhere in a city, okay, like San Francisco, for example, or New York. Or you might have a, a little Italy or a little Greece or something like that in one of these major cities. And they're primarily communities where these uh, immigrants all end up gathering because they have a shared culture, a shared sense of community, a shared language. Um, and again, they end up being um, areas where, in many cases, the government ends up basically turning a blind eye to whatever issues might crop up. So buildings might be falling apart, there might be more crime, more desperation. And so it's a, it's a situation where the government itself could do so much more than it actually does do. And so again, this is the when we start to see that pattern all right, that ends up leading into um, especially into the middle half of the 20th century, especially once we get into uh, the major civil rights movements in the United States with uh, gentrification in cities and so forth. And again, gentrification is not necessarily a, not always a positive thing, right? It's basically, uh, in many cases, it ends up being white people trying to whitewash an area to make it seem more appealing to them uh, and not necessarily always doing something about the actual issue, okay? So anyway. Not to climb on a soapbox or anything with that, but um, what we see here is individuals, once we start to see immigrants moving into inner cities especially, whatever residents lived there before, if they were part of the uh, old immigrant contingency or if they were natives of the United States, they end up being um, essentially uh, repelled or repulsed in some way by these new immigrants, and so they move out of these areas. Okay, and when they move out, all uh, all motivation for upkeep and so forth, for codes to be enforced and regulations to be enforced, all of that goes with them. Okay, so once these individuals leave a city, okay, once the old immigrants and the you know the native people of the United States end up leaving inner cities like that, they're left behind to rot, basically, these, these inner cities. And again, it's the same thing that ends up happening once we get into, especially the 1950s, leading well into the 1990s and even the 2000s in some cases. Right? A place like Detroit, for example, is still in that particular predicament today. And the other thing, too, that we've discussed very briefly is by 1882, um, there are so many Chinese immigrants arriving in the United States, and China has the, the largest population density of any country anywhere in the world, even today. Um, uh, I think uh, might have been surpassed by India, or at least it's running neck and neck today. Um, but there's so many Chinese immigrants coming to the United States that in 1882, the federal government passes what it calls the Chinese Exclusion Act. And what this does is it puts a complete and total ban, it cuts off immigration from China for anybody who is an unskilled worker. Okay? So Chinese immigrants who are unskilled workers are not allowed to enter the United States for 10 years. Okay? That's the first rule. Problem is, is this is renewed every 10 years until we get to 1943. Okay? So this is a, a 61 year span of time where um, the federal government says absolutely not to an entire ethnicity, an entire country. Okay? Um, and it's it's something that 
uh, today feels like it could be completely unheard of, although we have seen attempts to do that even in recent years. Cultural life in big cities starts to take uh, an upward swing in some cases, right? Uh, we start to see the, the construction of suburbs, okay? And suburbs are, again, where we start to see the middle class begin to migrate to. Okay, they start to leave inner cities, they start to leave tenement housing, because again, the standard of living starts to rise just slightly for them. They can afford more privacy, they can afford a, a, a family life uh, at home, right? They have uh, the construction of living rooms for the first time, right? You have leisure rooms or recreation rooms in your house. That's where the term living room comes from. And in urban areas, um, people really only migrate into urban areas uh, temporarily, perhaps for work or for politics. Uh, and again, as I said before, saloons become extremely popular as well. Um, and now we have new forms of mass entertainment that the country can start to engage in, right? No matter what social class you come from, right? You can engage in this. You can be a part of it somehow, either through word of mouth or by actually observing it yourself. Okay, so we start to see theaters and music halls, uh, museums, all these kinds of things, public venues that people can visit. Uh, and of course, sporting events, symphonies, circuses, all become popular during this point in time as well. Okay, uh, P.T. Barnum becomes extremely popular, right? Each city has its own sports team that people can rally around. Um, and again, if you have a home team, right, if even if your city is extremely diverse, like New York City is at this point in time, you have, you know, several dozens of ethnicities all gathered into the same place, they can all rally around the same team to go against another city's team. Okay, so it's a, um, you know, mass culture and popular culture begins to do more at this point in time, at least to unite people's interests uh, as, as in a common um, shared culture than anything. And as I said before, too, now that most of the new science and technology and uh, inventions and so forth are beginning to be used in the public sphere, we start to see that being used as a form of entertainment in some case. Okay, so motion pictures, for example, right? Phonographs, bicycles, and even automobiles eventually become a popular thing. It's estimated that in 1900, the United States actually has more saloons than it does grocery stores or meat markets. Okay, over 325,000 in the entire country, which is massively um, different from what we would expect. Okay, and saloons also have multiple um, functions as well. Okay, it's actually a place that uh, serves as a polling station for one. Okay, and this is uh, something that works again to the advantage of the Republican Party in big business because. If you can get people to vote for you, you take people to a saloon, you get them good and drunk, you hand them a voting ballot, and you tell them to vote for you because you just bought them a drink. Okay, So it's very easy for that level of corruption to seep in to all that. Of course, these are places where there's a lot of gossip, right? People talk there all the time. Um, there are job postings, so you might have a bulletin board somewhere, either inside or outside of a saloon, advertising work if you're looking for it. They act as postal centers even. There's a little kind of a cubby off in the corner where you might have a guy working a desk for that. Um, sometimes they even are so cosmopolitan that they might even have gymnasiums. Right, you might have a, an, uh, you know, I don't know if a, an indoor swimming pool is necessarily the, the thing of the time, but um, you know, some kind of maybe free weights that you can use or um, you know, maybe even some kind of a, a sports uh, area where you can play handball or something. I don't know. There's a lot of different variations of this. And of course, public restrooms as well. Um, right? You might have, and public restrooms at this point in time are still kind of an up in the air thing. Um, you might have just an outhouse kind of uh, crammed in between two buildings or in an alleyway, but um, sometimes you might actually have indoor plumbing. Most of the time, the main bar rooms are established for men only, uh, and this is a, something that, again, is basically tried to be um, passed off as some form of a, a moral superiority, right, that we're basically preventing women and children from being corrupted by these awful places, even though we're taking part in <laughs> some of the festivities ourselves as men. Uh, but women and children do have the option of uh, coming to a side door or a side window where they can actually purchase a pail of beer to carry home if there is a man at home, if he's incapacitated or something. And again, this is before any kind of 
uh, legal drinking age limit is really established in the United States. So you could be a, an eight-year-old kid showing up with uh, an empty bucket to a side door, and uh, some guy will pour you an entire bucket full of beer to take home to your dad. Okay. So this is, uh, uh, I think your textbook refers to this as, as called rushing the growler. <laughs> it's kind of a funny term. And of course, these um, saloons also typically have other side rooms known as wine rooms. Okay, uh, and in wine rooms, you usually have uh, a lot of prostitution. Okay, prostitutes are pretty common in most bar rooms anyway. They're very thinly disguised. <laughs> okay, if you've ever seen an old west film of any kind, right? Prostitutes are uh, available at just about any saloon that you that you can encounter. And again, women are not really being catered to at this point in terms of mass culture. Okay, they don't have as many social venues. Uh, there's not as many um, opportunities for women to uh, take part in all this. Okay, uh, if you are a married woman and you take care of the children, you end up just basically having to use what's called doorstep gossip to socialize. Right? You might talk with your your neighbor or your friend or something. You know, just um, and take your kids with you when the kids sit there on the stoop. And, and play or something while you gossip with your friend, if you have that opportunity. If you're a single woman, you might have more uh, variations uh, in terms of opportunities. You might not be tied down to a family of any kind, so you might be able to go visit a dance hall. You might be able to go to a theater or picnic grounds or something when you're not working, because chances are you are working. And the most popular form of entertainment uh, at this point in time for men and for women is the cinema. Okay, now that we actually have Thomas Edison establishing the first real um, film production company in the United States, um, most people are starting to gravitate toward that. And this is still, of course, in the early days of silent film, right? Sound doesn't actually become introduced to films until we get to probably the late 20s or even early 30s in some cases. Another brand new game changer that appears in the late 19th century and begins to be implemented more and more and more the further along in time we get is the theory of Darwinism. Okay. Charles Darwin, of course, as many people are familiar with, is the author of the uh, groundbreaking, groundbreaking book that we refer to as On the Origin of Species. Okay. And he writes this way back in the 1850s, right, 1859. And it doesn't actually start to gain in popularity until we really get to this particular time period. Um, because, as you can imagine, it was a very controversial book. And, of course, the theory of evolution is still extremely controversial even today among certain areas. And the whole idea of Darwinism is something that we refer to as natural selection. Okay? Um, Darwin posited that basically the way that all life on Earth ends up developing okay, is in these strange little fits and starts that over vast amounts of time end up amounting to the different species variations that we see in the world. Okay. The different um, exterior features and even interior features of various animals, various plants, and even humans in some cases. And basically what this says, the way that Darwinism works, okay, the theory uh, is not necessarily that humans evolved from monkeys, even though this is a, a very common trope that you hear used from time to time, but the whole idea of evolution is that if you have, for example, if we take something along the lines of, say, a mouse, okay, and most of the um, individual um, mice in this particular line, this particular lineage of mice, are all white mice, okay, and they are born into an area where uh, their natural habitat has black dirt, okay, and it's very easy for a white mouse to appear against black dirt, it's very easy for a hawk or another bird to swoop down and catch the mouse. What Darwin posits is that somehow over time, through some unseen means, um, a genetic mutation could occur to allow a specific mouse or specific mice in that family to, um, to develop survival techniques. Okay? So if you have several mice that are white mice, one of them might be born with darker colored fur, okay? perhaps with either a grayish or even black fur, ideally. Okay? And what happens then 
is that genetic mutation that has caused that mouse to grow black fur allows it to camouflage itself against the black dirt. And that way when hawks come down, swoop down, cat carry off the mice, most of the white mice will get carried off, but the black mouse will not. And that black mouse will then be able to go on and propagate the species, will be able to pass on this genetic mutation to further generations of mice. Okay, so you might have I don't know, five or six mice born from this one particular mouse, and maybe half of them will have black fur and half of them will not. And then the three with black fur will continue on and again and again and again as generations continue. And so this is why we see animals develop things like camouflage, or uh, why some birds have the ability for flight, where others uh, have the ability uh, to run at great speeds. Okay. So he's basically saying that this is a, a genetic mutation that basically occurs in some form or another that allows a species to adapt to its environment. That's the entire basis for Darwinism. And humans tend to take umbrage with this idea because at this point in time, much of the Western culture that is uh, serving as the backdrop for Darwin's theory um, deals with a, a fundamentalist interpretation of the Bible, right? A literal interpretation, right? Adam and Eve, you know, Garden of Eden, Noah's Ark, all that stuff. So what this basically says is that um, this may not have been the way, in fact, that things occurred. And of course, religious fundamentalists from this time period all the way to the present, uh, to the present have argued that this is uh, somehow blasphemous, that this flies in the face of everything uh, that people know and believe. The other thing that makes this controversial too is the fact that Darwinism posits that humans are not necessarily a superior species uh, to all other life forms on the planet. Basically saying that humans adapted and evolved in the same capacity as plants and animals. Okay, so our, our predecessors um, in terms of evolutionary science were not necessarily monkeys. Okay, monkeys and us had a common ancestor that was neither wholly ape nor wholly human. Okay, we are all apes in terms of the the classification of you know genomes and all that kind of stuff, but we did not necessarily evolve from say a spider monkey. Okay, a spider monkey and us we all evolved from a common similar species. Okay, and so again, this, this flies in the face of what uh, literal biblical interpretations of the history of humankind uh, try to posit, but Darwin says that there is, um, there, there's enough evidence in the fossil record to suggest that this is what has occurred. Where this takes a left turn and where Darwin says the, the idea ends up failing is something called uh, social Darwinism. Okay. And uh, another sociologist, a social philosopher named Herbert Spencer, is the one who coins the term survival of the fittest. Okay. And even though in a technical sense, this is what Darwin is referring to, um, Spencer is saying that there is basically an intelligent um, apparatus at play here, that humans can actively push each other out of the way, can push other species out of the way with this particular knowledge. And it prompts a, a continual cycle of competition to uh, establish dominance. Okay? And as you can imagine, individuals like Rockefeller and Carnegie and a lot of the robber barons during this time period are extremely fond of this idea because it legitimizes all of their crooked business dealings, basically gives them license to use whatever means necessary to suppress their own competition. And of course, it's used for political reasons as well, right? It argues against any kind of government regulations, um, and it says that the government needs to continue to practice this laissez-faire policy where there is no government intervention at all. And therefore, if you are a smaller business that is struggling, or if you are a, a poor, a sick, or a dying immigrant coming to the United States, hey, it's not our fault that you're getting sick and dying or that your business is going under. It's evolution that's doing it. Okay, So again, for better or for worse, science and evolution and the, um, the different scientific theories of the day are used in many ways to justify human actions. Okay, And that's not necessarily their entire purpose. To combat this idea, uh, a guy named William Graham Sumner writes a book that he refers to as Folkways, saying that... Um, uh, well, not necessarily combating it, but going along with it, I suppose, getting it mixed up with someone else, 
Sumner says that uh, government-sponsored equality should not be a thing. He says that the, the government should not try to intervene or interfere with anything at all. He says basically if, if these uh, you know, immigrants or, or other businesses are suffering and dying, they should not receive patronage from anybody else. They should basically be left to die. And of course, Darwin himself says that this is a horrible idea. He says, you're, you're, you're taking what I'm saying and you're blowing it out of proportion, you're corrupting it, this is not what I'm talking about. The fellow who comes out against what Sumner and what Spencer is trying to say, and this is the guy that I got mixed up a moment ago, is Lester Frank Ward. Okay? And he pushes for what he refers to as Reform Darwinism. Okay? And what Reform Darwinism says is we need, uh, because there is a human element, element in evolution now, now that we have the sense and understanding of potentially how this works. He says if we can collaborate, perhaps we can help guide it in a positive direction. And he writes a book in 1883 called Dynamic Sociology that says that um, we, we have a better sense, of, or a better chance of success as, as humans, as a planet, as, as life in general through cooperation than we do competition. He says competition is only going to create more competition, more death, more destruction, more corruption, and all of the above. But more cooperation might lead us to actually live in greater harmony with one another. Okay, so uh, again, Darwinism is uh, uh, still very much a controversial idea even today. Right, there are still places in the in the United States that refuse to teach Darwinism because uh, of how much it offends uh, religion. And the other thing that Ward also um, uh, comes out in favor of is he says that rather than the government's turning a blind eye, he says governments should try to step in and alleviate poverty and promote education of some kind as well. So he says that uh, this is a, another responsibility that government should have that it doesn't always take uh, under its wing. Beginning in 1879, the politics of the Gilded Age become marked by this uh, principle that continues almost all the way into the, the first uh, decade, really, of the 20th century, and that is that there are no leaders and there are no principles, really. There's no heroes in politics at this point, um, even though... Uh, one party still continues to pitch itself as the party of Lincoln. The other party gradually begins to pitch it as the party of the common man. Um, there, there is no real commitment to the, the party line in this case. All right? um, the party line really only being uh, as uh, successful as it relates to big business. Okay? And that's really the only um, fulfilled promise that ever gets uh, put into place in this, uh, in this little dynamic. As a result, and because the federal government is having so much trouble uh, extending its authority to every corner of the country, most of the political activity in the United States, the successful political activity, we'll put it that way, occurs at the state and the local levels. Okay? Um, and again, the federal government has tried and tried again to, um, to stretch itself as much as possible after the Civil War, and it's still having a difficult time uh, exerting its authority wherever it needs to. Uh, for one thing, in 1879, the entire federal workforce only has 51,000 people working for it, and only 6,000 of them are working in Washington, D.C. And that sounds like a lot, but at the time period, the, uh, the railroad industry, by comparison, has um, uh, somewhere in the hundreds of thousands of workers, okay? so easily double what, um, what the federal government has. And of course, political parties become kind of the uh, the, the social magnets for, for individuals who want some kind of uh, social interaction, who want to be able to share their values with one another. They do create a sense of community, um, but there's um, there's not really a whole lot of uh, personal fulfillment involved. Okay, uh, the political parties tend to collect dues from members during this time period. Of course, this still happens. Um, if you're registered with a political party, if you give regular donations, this is typically what happens. And of course, if you're a member of the Republican Party in particular, you're getting a lot of contributions from big business, and you turn around and you scratch the back of big business at the same time. Um, when it comes to city politics in particular, we're still far and away from the time period where we move into having a city manager or having um, you know, a, 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 a town hall of some kind. Uh, and so city politics tend to be controlled in various districts of the city by these little uh, political rings headed by a boss of some kind. 
Okay, and it works almost like a mafia situation where you have something akin to a crime ring headed by uh, a mafia boss, essentially. Um, the most famous one in this particular instance is William Boss Tweed, who runs uh, Tammany Hall in New York City. Okay, and he's the quintessential uh, example of a political boss because he. Uh, he again, he operates just like a, a, a mafioso individual. Okay, he ends up uh, taking bribes and giving bribes, uh, receiving and extending political favors, and uh, most of the jobs that he ends up doling out are given to political supporters of his. Uh, he gives contracts out to business allies for a percentage of what they get. Okay. And this is all uh, under the the auspices of the patronage system. This is something that the Republican Party throughout the, the Gilded Age claims that it is trying to fight against, and there is a certain contingency that does, but time and time again, it's, uh, it comes across as hypocritical, okay, because the, um, the Republican Party never actually fully commits to fighting the system. And the whole idea that the Republican Party is trying to do here, or at least what it says it's trying to do, is to remove the patronage system and replace it with a merit system. In other words, you have to earn the job in order to receive it. Right? You can't just be um, an influential person's drinking buddy or their cousin or brother or whatever. And of course, uh, individuals like Boss Tweed end up rigging elections on a regular basis. Um, the thing that keeps them in power, though, and the thing that endears them specifically to the working class more, th more than anything else is the fact that even though they are corrupt, even though they do constantly um, you know, uh, do under-the-table dealings and so forth, they also provide a sense of social structure and social services to a lot of communities, specifically in inner cities. Okay, so it's a it's a strange dynamic, and this is something that um, gets repeated, and it almost becomes something of a trope over time, uh, especially with mafia individuals like Al Capone. Capone was famous for starting one of the first uh, soup kitchens in the United States, right during the Great Depression. Right, so um, it it endears them as some sort of a an outlaw figure of sorts. And even in the modern day, if we look at things on a global scale, um, uh, even international uh, terrorist organizations like Hamas, for example, do this exact same thing. They provide social services to, to individuals in Middle Eastern countries uh, that they end up occupying, and it ends up endearing them to the local population, gets them on their side in a certain way. So it's, it's almost like a, a form of uh, kind of dirtying up the common individual by making them complicit somehow, almost. So it's a, it's a very... Um, uh, deep-rooted um, dynamic, I guess is the best way I can put it. National politics, uh, again, are kind of a different story because the Republicans and the Democrats at this point are so evenly divided uh, in terms of their support. Um, the country is still divided almost in a geographical sense, almost exclusively in this way. Democratic Party makes a little bit of a comeback in 1876 after Rutherford B. Hayes agrees to end Reconstruction. Okay, the um, the South finally starts to ramp up more and more support for uh, the Democratic Party, specifically because the Reconstruction governments that are Republican-led in the South end up falling back into Democratic control afterward. Okay, and the Democratic Party at this point is still um, still entrenched in many of the uh, the sort of leftovers of Confederate ideology. Okay, again, it's, it's too easy to just wholly ascribe them that particular moniker. Right, they're not all Confederates, but um, they they tend to lean in that particular direction. Although they are gradually moving out of it uh, slowly but surely. Voter turnout in most elections is usually between 70 and 80 percent, so most people are actually uh, expressing uh, their opinion, they are expressing with their votes, um, and politics tend to be extremely emotional, right? The Democrats are still, uh, at this point in time at least, lumped in with Confederates, right? They are blamed for, for seceding from the Union, they're blamed for the Civil War, in some cases they're even still blamed for assassinating Abraham Lincoln, okay? And at the same time, too, the Republicans tried to take credit for being the party of Lincoln, right? And you still hear that touted from time to time, even today. Um, they tried to take credit for abolishing slavery, for saving the Union. But at the same time, too, because they have climbed in with big business, uh, and even as you see here with the political cartoon in the background, this kind of um, over-the-top uh, image of these uh, big uh, money bag giant individuals here at the back of the Congressional House, 
with congressmen sitting in front of them kind of being intimidated by them, right? This is a very um, accessible image of what the, what the Republican Party is dealing with during this time period, right? Big business is constantly breathing down its neck, looking for a way to, um, uh, to influence politics somehow, okay? And when we start seeing third parties come into play, right, this is when we uh, see third parties in particular begin to take a much more prominent role in American politics. Um, we've already seen the Greenback Party uh, during the, the Civil War and immediately thereafter. Um, Greenback Party, again, is trying to uh, create more inflation in the economy by printing up more paper money. Okay. Um, populists end up being uh, kind of a, a next level uh, evolution, I guess you could say, of, po of greenbackism. It's kind of the same ideology. Uh, populists tend to look more at doing inflation in the economy specifically through silver coins, uh, which we'll talk a little bit more about as we get toward the end of this chapter. Uh, and populists are really looking to try to hand over control of U.S. politics back to the common people. Okay, so uh, in a way, it mirrors in some respects Jacksonian democracy, right? Trying to give the working class a, a bigger voice in politics, um, specifically targeting farmers and wage workers. Okay, and then of course you start to see more um, issue-based things like uh, prohibition parties. Okay, um, temperance movements and so forth become extremely popular during this time because we have sociologists now taking a look at what they consider to be the, the quote-unquote problems with society. Okay? And alcohol is constantly looked at as a source of corruption and so forth um, when it comes to uh, areas like uh, pubs and, and so forth in the United States. Um, pubs also double as polling stations. So it's very easy for a political candidate to simply hold a little small rally at a pub, get all their supporters good and wasted, and then hand them a ballot and get them to check off their name. Okay, so it's, uh, it's, it's easy for uh, people to see those two things going hand in hand, right? Alcohol and corruption somehow. And also physical violence, right? People are starting to take notice of the fact that um, you know, domestic abuse is becoming a problem. Um, people are beginning to blame that on alcohol as well. So there's all kinds of ways of approaching this type of thing. Um, and again, when it comes to political parties in the United States, there tends to be a big geographical uh, factor in where they are actually located. Republicans are typically strongest in New England and in the North and Midwestern portion of the United States during this period. And again, it constantly touts itself as the party of morality, okay? And uh, again, it's not necessarily uh, an accurate statement at this point because it does engage in probably the most corruption in terms of bribery and, uh, and kickbacks and those sorts of things. But regardless of that, it ends up dominating the White House uh, for most of the presidential administrations between 1869 when Ulysses S. Grant is elected president and 1913 when Woodrow Wilson finally you know, ends that running streak. Okay, so it's a it's a very long period of time that um, things are kind of they get very stagnant in U.S. politics. Let's put it that way. And by the 1880s, uh, the the main social issues that try to gain traction in terms of uh, lobbying for support in politics include um, the prohibition and temperance movements, and also uh, certain nativist movements as well. Okay, we see in the 1880s the, um, the the Chinese Exclusion Act, for example, right, which targets removing um, any uh, any open door policy when it comes to uh, uh, unskilled Chinese workers and entering the United States. So immigration becomes a really uh, big focus now because we've we've told people please come, please be workers here in the United States. And so many people have shown up right in the in the tens of millions that we end up uh, having to essentially close the gates and try to push people away. And in some cases, it takes legislation to do it. Okay, and so. Um, and most of the, the immigration uh, nativist response, that is, has to do specifically with the working class here, right? Because you have individuals who are, and more specifically, white working class males uh, are the ones who are constantly trying to petition uh, to, you know, get these kinds of legislations put through because they believe that all of their jobs are being taken from them, that they are somehow being marginalized and all this. So there's there's all kinds of uh, different sides to this particular argument. When it comes to the the temperance movement, one uh, really funny little character. Uh, in in hindsight, it, she she seems like a funny character. The at the time, she was pretty serious about what she was doing. 
uh, is a lady named Carrie Nation. And if you can see here from her image, she's a, a tiny little old lady holding uh, what appears to be a Bible in her left hand and a hatchet in the other one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and what she would literally do is she would walk into a saloon on any given day, walk straight up to the bar, and instead of ordering a drink, she would whip out the hatchet and begin hacking at the bar, hacking at the walls, literally trying to tear down a saloon by hand. Okay, She would physically attack them. And occasionally she would have supporters who would come along with her and do the same thing, and they would have to be forcibly removed. Okay, They don't really do as much structural damage as you would think they would do, but I mean, it's a little old lady wearing wielding a hatchet, right? But uh, if you get enough people there, right, it, it can create a, enough of a disturbance, it can cause enough property damage, but uh, it's there to make a statement, right? She believes that um, the uh, that saloons and so forth create so much corruption that they need to be completely rooted out, okay? So individuals like her are the ones who end up uh, leading to the actual prohibition era that we see in, in, the, in the 1920s. The Democratic Party, on the other hand, is a little bit more diverse in terms of what it's after. Um, it's, it's still, again, trying to recover its reputation after the Civil War has ended. And it's, uh, it's not necessarily so geographically isolated like the Republican Party is. Um, even though Republicans don't really have much of a presence in the South because of um, the Reconstruction era and Klan violence and intimidation and so forth, much of that support has been forcibly removed from the South. Um, there is a large contingency of Southern whites who are still conservative, who are, do support the Democratic Party. And then there is also a, a small um, contingency up north who are Catholic, who also support the more conservative um, movements in the United States. Okay? So over time, the, the political parties, instead of being divided equally on north and south lines, you almost see the Republican Party being uh, kind of sandwiched in between two different factions of the Democratic Party. Right? There's a small section in the south and one in the north, and then the Republican Party is kind of isolated somewhere in the middle. So it's, a, uh, it's, it's becoming a very different dynamic. And the other thing about presidents during this time period is they, they tend to be more figureheads and mouthpieces for, uh, for Congress than anything else. They don't really ever put forth any solid legislation to speak of. There's one or two instances where they do, but most of the time they end up deferring specifically to the party leaders and to Congress itself. Okay, they don't really act as, um, uh, as overly important figures. And if you ask any individual on the street today to name a Gilded Age president, most of the time they are not able to do it because most of these presidents don't really make that much of a splash. And to go along with that and to kind of prove my point, between 1872 and 1896, all of these Gilded Age presidents, none of them win a majority of the popular vote. Okay? Politics are that evenly divided, and it actually ends up taking the swing states in this country to make all the difference. Okay? And swing states are states like Indiana, uh, some places uh, along the kind of the north and south lines. Sometimes New York can be considered a swing state depending on the situation and the time. But um, these swing states are ones that can possibly, they're so evenly divided in terms of their support that we end up seeing them swing either one direction to one political party or back the other way to the other political party. Um, Iowa, in, in today's terms, tends to be considered something of a swing state, right? This is when we have, uh, any time a presidential election comes out, you have the Iowa caucus, right? Which essentially determines uh, what political candidates are going to get the most support from one party or another, and then when that's established, right, which, um, which presidential candidate is going to actually get uh, the more support from that state. And because swing states become so important, uh, again, beginning in 1872 and going all the way until 1908, eight different presidents are elected by swing states. It takes that deciding vote, that little grain of sand to tip the scales one way or the other.